This came from a video that uh, a good brother in Christ sent me, and it, it talked about age segregation and discipleship in the church. And so the question that I got from this is, uh, is segregation of age groups in the church biblical? That's the first part. And the second part is, um, is this segregation of ages adding to the hindrance of natural discipleship within the body of Christ? Uh, and is it deleterious? Is that what, uh, the question was, uh, uh, where does age segregation come in the church and is it harmful? Is, is it that... harmful to cultivating natural discipleship? Um, is it harmful for uh, discipleship? Thanks very much, Josh. By the way, um, for you, Tony, what year are you on? As long as your son told us it's your birthday, what year is it? I was born in 1957 and I'm 57. 57. Our custom in our family is we read from the 57th Psalm, and it says in Psalm 57, verse 1, in the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge. So uh, may this be a great year of you uh, finding your refuge in the shadow of the Lord's wings. That's just a, if you want to give someone a nice gift, give them a verse. Okay, uh, to answer uh, this question that, that Josh asked uh, about age segregation, uh, just the history, age segregation within the church. In other words, having um, age level Sunday schools, even having, you know, like all the young Marys together and all the, uh, those raising children together and all of that. Uh, where did that come from? That takes us to the concept of uh, what we call Sunday school. Uh, Sunday school in the history of the church didn't start until the year 1789, uh, same year as uh, the American uh, Constitutional Convention. Uh, it was started in England by a fella named uh, Robert Rakes, um, and he, his goal was not to help the church. His goal was to reach children, the, the working children. Remember in England, they worked in the mines, they worked in the mills, there were many orphans, and, and children were basically uh, preyed upon, and it, because they were so small, they could crawl through the little tiny passageways of those uh, coal mines. And many of them were dying young of black lung and tuberculosis and everything else. And so Robert Rakes in England began this idea, and it slowly moved across the channel and to America, and became known as the Sabbath school. It was not on Saturday, which is the Sabbath day. Uh, it was on Sunday, but they called it Sabbath school, which helped deepen this idea that Sunday is the Sabbath. We talked about that two weeks ago. And where it really took fire is a fella named D.L. Moody. If you've ever heard of D.L. Moody, uh, the shoe salesman that was saved and, and, uh, and just ministered immensely, he picked up this Sabbath school, Sunday school, uh, and really promoted it huge. And, and he built one of the larger Sunday schools in the, uh, the mid-1800s. So, but back to, is there a biblical basis uh, for having little people out of the service? Um, other than the only verse that, that people go to is in Matthew 18 where Jesus said, suffer the little children to come to me. So that becomes, you know, let, because the children came and sat on Christ's lap. But, but that's true that, that you should minister to little children, but it never really says that, that you should pull them out. Um, the, the, some people have asked about having uh, men's classes and women's classes. Now that is more defensible from the Bible and boys and girls classes because Titus 2, uh, if you remember, um, we, we were studying through Titus 2 and as we did, we saw that, that it's targeting older men, then older women, then younger women, and then younger men. And so basically, God does see that there is a reason to just speak to men and just speak to women, but then when he has the older and the younger, that would be perhaps the only place that the scriptures within the context, going back to Josh's question, 
of the age segregation, the only place that we really could come up with it is in Titus II, having a curriculum that is age specified, that, that you're supposed to group together the older and teach them certain things, and you're supposed to group together the younger and teach them specific things. Now, as a pastor, do I think, and, and by the way, this is a movement, Josh, I don't even know if you know that, uh, what is it called? Does anybody know? It's a movement across America. They call it... There we go. Fa thank you. Who said that? There we go. Kirby, thank you. Uh, family integrated uh, church. Integrated. And uh, the question is, is family integrated the biblical model? Does the scripture teach... Uh, the family integrated. Well, we could put it this way, it displays it. If you remember, the early church gathered as a family, they gathered in homes, and they didn't ship the kids off to the park. They actually met and gathered and, and taught the, the uh, assembly together. So much so that by the time you get to the book of Acts, uh, the apostle Paul is teaching, and this young fella is sitting, remember Eutychus? Uh, was sitting up in the window in the third or second story listening to this long sermon and it got darker and later and he got tired and he fell out the window and died. And the, the way you remember his name, Eutychus, is Eutychus too if you'd have fallen out of that window and died. But that's how they teach it to you. But, but the biblical model is that it was in homes and it was families. But once we moved out of homes and into large buildings like this, it just became a natural kind of a uh, pragmatic approach to ministry to instead of having all the babies crying, instead of having all the certain ages, you know, wiggling and everything, it would be much nicer if we just moved them out. Which comes back to uh, what Josh is asking. Uh, is it harmful? Now think about it for a minute. How many men really know how to teach the Bible to their children? How many feel comfortable without, without giving them a video to actually sit with the Bible and explain it to them and discuss it and talk with them? See, the, what we've lost is that, that uh, we have talented, you know, Jeremy Willits that can keep like yesterday, uh, you, you would have been run over by all the middle schoolers here having so much fun. And he is an expert with the middle schoolers and, and Justin with the high schoolers and, and you know, write down all of our Sunday school teachers. But most people never see that happening. And, and they've never seen the children being trained and taught and brought to their level. So is there a modeling of discipleship that's maybe a little bit missing in our modern model that actually, uh, most people don't realize, Sunday school started in 1789. Invitationalism started in the late 1820s with you know, Charles Grandison Finney himself, the invitationalist. There were not walk the aisle invitations anywhere present that we know of in church history before you know, in America in the 1820s, and there was no Sunday school segregating the ages going on regularly until the time of the American Revolution. So before that time, what was going on is basically uh, targeted at times ministry, but most often in homes with families and then in churches where again, it was, you know, kind of like a lot of us grew up in. The church was so small that, that you had this clump for Sunday school, and, and it was, I mean, you couldn't have separate grades because you only had one or two, and, and you just kind of did something with them, but whenever even that elderly lady that did that was sick, it, they were back in the service. And so the, this movement is really going towards something that they're hearkening back to what maybe the first century church was like, but I don't know if, if, we're, if there's really a biblical model. Uh, I mean, if, if there was a model, 
in the pastoral epistles. Our model comes from the epistles. And we don't see Paul instructing to keep the children off or not to. See, it, it would have been very clear because the church at Ephesus got so large, they had a lot of children. So it's one of those areas where people, the family integrated people are very, when I go out and speak at conferences, they usually hit me first and they say, you know, are you a supporter? And I said, oh, I'm a big family supporter. I have a big family and I'm a big family supporter. But do I think that you should force your church to shut down Sunday school and put them all in the service? No, I, I wouldn't advocate that. You know why? It would cause what the last verse of 1 Corinthians 14 says we shouldn't have. The last verse of 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40 says, let all things be done, what? Order. Yeah, decently and in order. And just to just wholesale stop it all and bring them all in wouldn't be healthy. Maybe, you know, gradually doing that uh, in a setting where it's possible.